Hi guys, welcome to this month's Real English video. In these videos, I take you around Edinburgh, talk about Scotland's history and culture, and you get a great English lesson at the same time. This month, we've gone all romantic, because we're talking about the history of weddings. So, let's go! thought about Scotland as your wedding destination? Well, you wouldn't be alone because around 20% of weddings that take place in Scotland every year are from non-residents. Scotland has a really long tradition of being seen as a very romantic place to get married. However, as with so much Scottish history that we've seen, there's a lot of myths surrounding what we consider to be real traditions. And in fact, a lot of the real traditions we have have kind of disappeared. So we're going to be talking about what's myth, why it's become fact, and some real wedding history and traditions in Scotland. Let's go. If you're planning a destination wedding in Scotland, you very may well be considering having a hand fasting as part of your ceremony. Hand fasting has become incredibly popular and is very much associated with the concept of neo-paganism. In a nutshell, hand fasting basically means that the couple get to kind of test drive their marriage to see if it's right for them. So they get a year and a day to decide if it works for them, and if it doesn't, then they can just go their separate ways. So many people believe that this is an ancient Celtic slash Scottish tradition, including myself, by the way, because I had one of these at my wedding. However, when we start to unpick the history, the reality is hand fasting as we understand it and celebrate it now doesn't actually exist. So we have records of the word hand fasting from, from many centuries ago, but in both England and Scotland, what that simply meant to be hand fasted was basically to be engaged. Yeah, you'd made a commitment to be married to somebody. But of course, back in those days, this kind of a commitment or betrothal was seen as a much more serious arrangement than you would find in a modern day engagement. In fact, a previous betrothal or hand fasting was one of the very few reasons that you could actually get a divorce in Catholic Scotland. It certainly wasn't the very romantic idea we have now of hand fasting as often represented in TV or films or books, such as that famous scene in Braveheart and, of course, in Outlander. Marriage in medieval Scotland was very different in a lot of respects to modern marriage. For starters, you didn't need a priest to get married. You could get married in the middle of a forest with just squirrels for witnesses, and it would be considered valid. This did, of course, have its problems, because if you wanted to prove you were married, for example, to claim an inheritance, it made it harder. There were generally three different kinds of irregular marriages in Scotland. The one I mentioned before, let's call that squirrel marriage, where uh, you declare yourself married in front of witnesses. The other was a promise of marriage. This meant that if you promised to marry somebody, and if this was followed by a sexual relationship, then you were man and wife. You did, however, need to have some kind of evidence of that promise, like a written vow. Finally, you had a marriage by habit and repute, which just basically meant you'd been living together for so long, it was assumed that you were husband and wife. People chose these kind of weddings for more or less the same reasons that people choose to elope nowadays. They're cheaper, they're easier, less hassle. Uh, if there's family members that don't agree, you can avoid that problem as well. And of course, if your intentions weren't honorable, it was much easier to deny that the marriage had ever happened. It's important to see, though, that these kind of marriages have the same legal standing as a church wedding and that any children that came out of these marriages were considered legitimate. One of the reasons behind this kind of marriage, it was believed it was a system that could protect women from unscrupulous men, men who might seduce them with promises of marriage or fake wedding ceremonies. Of course, the church didn't like this. They weren't keen on these kind of marriages and they preferred people to get married officially within the church. However, when Scotland became Protestant, the Protestant Kirk actually continued to tolerate these weddings. Although they didn't like this kind of marriage, it at least meant that people weren't living in sin. 
Eventually, registration was introduced and anyone who had had an irregular marriage could present themselves to a sheriff and a magistrate to make it official. You would be convicted of having an irregular marriage, but it was often cheaper to pay that fine than to pay for all of the faff of having a real wedding ceremony. But although irregular marriages were still considered legal in Scotland, it was not the case in England. In 1753, an act was passed which meant you needed parental permission to get married below the age of 21. This wasn't the case in Scotland, where it was 12 years old for girls and 14 years old for boys. Shockingly, this didn't change until 1929, when the age of consent was finally raised to 16. What all this meant was that a border town in Scotland called Gretna Green turned into the 18th century Las Vegas. This town became the home of quickie marriages. It was made famous in literature, such as in books like Pride and Prejudice, and became synonymous with elopement. Runaway marriages or anvil marriages became seen as the ultimate thing in romance. They were called anvil marriages because that's often where the ceremony took place over the anvil where the rings were created. Despite Gretna Green being the ultimate runaway wedding destination, it wasn't actually very popular with Scots. In fact, Scottish lawyers were really irritated by Scotland's reputation for condoning these kind of weddings. These weddings could result in many problems. First of all, because proper records weren't kept, meaning that if you needed to prove that you'd been married, it could be tricky to do so. And they were also very easy to abuse. Take, for example, the Shrigley abduction in 1827, which saw a 15-year-old heiress being taken to Gretna Green against her will and married by a 30-year-old man who was after her money. Luckily, after a court case, the marriage was annulled. To try and solve this problem, the Scottish Marriage Act was passed in 1856. This meant that at least one of the couple getting married had to have been living in Scotland for minimum 21 days. But despite these changes, border marriages still continued. The high point of Gretna Green was probably in the 1930s, thanks to improvements in motor cars and also the expansion of local hotels. This made a visit to Gretna Green seem once again very romantic. The 21-day rule was eventually abolished in 1977, and once again, Gretna became fashionable. So everything we've discussed so far is very different from the modern neo-paganist idea of hand fasting and what Celtic wedding traditions are. So where did this myth start? Well, we have Scotland's most famous myth maker to thank for that. It is, of course, once again, Sir Walter Scott. Walter Scott most likely read about this concept of hand fasting in a book called Tour of Scotland by Thomas Pennant. Thomas Pennant was a naturalist and a very famous writer. He's widely credited with having increased a lot of English tourism to Scotland. Although his writing was and continues to be very respected, there are some that criticised him for not always being particularly diligent in his research, especially when he wanted to embellish a story. It's his story of a Highland fair where people would get married and the year later decide if it had worked out for them that caught Walter Scott's eye. Scott took this idea of the hand fasting and included it in his novel The Monastery, a supernatural historical romance set in the mid-16th century. And thanks to the time frame that Scott chose, this idea of hand fasting suddenly became seen as an ancient tradition, even though it never really existed that way. Like I said earlier, popular culture then took this idea and expanded it further. So we see things like the ceremony in Braveheart and, of course, the Gallic blood oath that Claire and Jamie give in their wedding in the Outlander series. Diana Gabaldon is actually on record saying that she invented all of this, but it's just added more to the myth. And ironically, we do actually have a lot of real Scottish wedding traditions. It's just that most of us have forgotten about them. For example, the bride's cake. This is a scone or shortbread made by the bride's mother, and it gets broken over her head before the wedding. If it breaks into small pieces, that means the match will be a success. Another one is the wedding scramble. In this tradition, the groom or the best man throw coins to the local kids waiting outside the church for them to scramble and pick them up. This was believed to bring the newlyweds good luck. And finally, suit foot and blackening, or feet washing. To signify that she was getting married, the bride would have her feet covered in soot from the fire, which represented hearth and home. And then her feet would be washed by her friends. Grooms, however, had worse luck because their feet would be covered in soot and feathers. Over time, this practice got crazier, with the groom being covered head to foot and things like tar, feathers, flour, boot polish, treacle and eggs. In fact, this tradition is still practiced today, especially on the northeast coast of Scotland. Modern Scottish weddings are mainly civil and humanist ceremonies these days, with hand fasting being a really popular option. 
but I'd argue that the best development in modern Scottish weddings was the one made in 2014 when gay marriage was made legal in Scotland. Civil partnerships were made legal in 2005, but you weren't legally allowed to describe yourself as married. Scotland was the first of the UK nations to make it legal, closely followed by England, but woefully behind many other countries. So while our modern conception of hand fasting doesn't actually have the historical data to back its neo-paganist claims, I suppose the bigger question is, does it really matter? It's a really lovely idea and one that's captured the hearts of people around the world. Perhaps the main lesson to take away from all this is that traditions become traditions because we make it that way. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time. Bye.